15 as we welcome in our co-host on the day. Solo co-host, New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap. Good morning, Johnny. Good morning. Beautiful day today. Yeah, don't get used to it. I know. 90s I know. over the weekend, man. These are, these are the teasers. And then back to mid-90s by next week. Yep. So summer, it's nice when you get a little break like this. Uh, I like the idea of summer better than summer itself sometimes because I'm just not a fan of 95 to 100 every day for a it, while, you know. And the humidity. It just, the oppressive humidity of a couple of weeks ago. Just awful. Yeah, it was just brutal. You just yep. walk out of your house with <sighs> again, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're always sweaty. But this has been a nice break. I've enjoyed it. Has. it. Although uh, 49, it's like 48, 49 this morning uh, when you stepped out. It's a brief walk from the parking lot to the door. And by the way, what do you think about the newly paved parking lot? It's nice. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's Mr. Hornby really coming through there. Hey, Hedgesville High School's class of 79 has their 45th reunion Friday, October the 11th. They'll do this at the Holiday Inn starting at 6 in the evening. It's $50 for the dinner. My old buddy Don Ripple is the DJ. And if you should... Uh, be interested in attending. October 1 is the RSVP date to Susan Snowden at SR Snowden, S N O W D E N, at frontier.com. Also, the classes of 78 and 80 are welcome to attend too. Yesterday, when we left you, and uh, on the sports mix at noon, they picked this up as well. Four Mountaineer tickets to the West Virginia Penn State game, August 31st, Section 103. The bidding was at $1,250. Whoever wins the bid gets the tickets. We're going to do this, I think, through Friday's show, maybe through the 10 o'clock deadline there. We're going to donate all the money to the backpack program. The Berkeley County backpack program is going to get every dollar of this. So you can still bid in the Facebook comment section during the program today. At uh, 1250 is the mark right now. If you uh, want those seats, you have to top that by uh, a penny at least. And then you get the seats. As we speak... Maria Lawrenson right now is the top bidder. She's got the seats. Our first guest, Lucia Valentine, who, if I recall from our previous interview, is Italian. Lucia, good morning. Yes. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you guys? Excellent. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. You are a candidate for the House of Delegates, 97th Democratic Party. Yes. In a district that you were telling us has a pretty equal distribution of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. Yeah, it's almost um, one third, one third, one third. So yeah. we're really focused on uh, reaching out to independents and um, uh, persuadable voters. What's a persuadable voter? So we are um, looking at uh, both independents and um, persuadable Republicans as well to really try to re reach across the aisle and find common ground with folks across the district on issues that we all um, you know, share interest in. What are the issues that you're hearing about as you go? I assume you're doing some door to door at this point already. Yes, yes, we started canvassing. It's going to be ramping up throughout the fall. Mm -hmm. um, I'm focused on, uh, you know, good public schools, securing access to clean air and water, supporting economic development. We've also heard, you know, a conversation around growth and childcare and things like that. So really, just trying to listen as much as possible right now to the voters um, to help inform. Uh, the policies that I think should be brought forward at the state level. Mm -hmm. And what kind of reception are you getting? I think we've had really great conversations. I've been campaigning for almost a year now, and so I think that, you know, nine times out of ten, we're able to find common ground. We have a lot um, in common. Folks are really concerned about similar issues and some of the same things right now, and so we're really just capitalizing on that energy in that moment to, to work together. Tell me about the difference campaigning with Joe Biden at the top of the ticket and now the change. Yeah. Have you seen a change on the, the energy? Have you seen a change in the reception that you're getting? I think the energy that we're seeing at the national level really just shows that folks are ready for a new generation of leadership. Um, and I'm really excited about um, all the ways that that's brought new energy to campaigning at the national level, at the state level. But I'm really focused on, um, you know, the issues here at home. I'm an independent thinker. The people of District 97 are independent thinkers. And so I'm really just focused on the policies that um, we can find common ground on. Tell us a bit about your background. Yeah, so I grew up here in the Eastern Panhandle. I graduated from Jefferson uh, High School, Shepherd University, um, and I'm here to stay and have spent most of my adult life and adult career advocating for West Virginians. Um, I've worked at the state capitol for the past three years as a legislative advocate, uh, helping to pass legislation that helps protect the health of West Virginia's people and resources. Um, so I really have experience working in the legislative capacity, be, capacity, working across the aisle, finding common ground with folks and passing meaningful legislation at the Capitol. Tell me about the 97th delegate district, the geography of it. 
So um, it is the um, eastern or the westernmost part of Shepherdstown up to Whiting's Neck down um, 480 into Kearneysville, a little bit of Shenandoah Junction, and then the easternmost part of Berkeley County, um, Berkeley County Fairgrounds, a little bit of 45 heading towards downtown. So um, it's pretty chopped up in some ways. It's an interesting district. It's very rural, very residential. I don't have a lot of um, downtown proper of either Shepherdstown or Martinsburg. Um, but home to a lot of generational farmers, a lot of neighborhoods and new neighborhoods. What is the percentage breakdown of Berkeley County residents versus Jefferson County residents in your district? It's 70% Berkeley County, 30% um, Jefferson. Mr. Gilstra. So you're promoting programs that are in, in favor of public schools and clean air. I'm going to guess you don't get a lot of pushback on that. Not a lot of people are saying, no, mm -hmm. I want crappy schools and dirty air, <laughs> right? So, um, so what... Are you, what do you want to see done that hasn't been done? Because mm -hmm. you're running for an open seat, so you're not trying mm -hmm. to unseat somebody else. Sure. So what programs would you like to see implemented that were improved or, or taken away mm -hmm. that, that in, within the legislature? Related to education? And uh, with like education and clean air or whatever? Yeah. So I think when it comes to education, you know, I spent some time shadowing um, teachers and students back in the spring before the end of the school year just to really um, spend time in their space, spend time in schools and figure out what's working, what's not working. Um, and talking to students, I was talking to to junior and seniors at Martinsburg High School. And um, mental health is the number one thing students are bringing up. They feel unsupported in schools. They feel unsupported in the community. They want to see more resources available to them, um, more school counselors available and things like that. Um, they were also talking about uh, the ways that they feel technology and cell phones especially have gotten in the way of their learning. Um, and so this teacher that I was shadowing actually makes students put their phones away at the be beginning of class. And they, the students were actually appreciative of that. They feel like they were were, you know being held accountable to really focus in the class and learn and I was actually um, excited to hear that Berkeley County is going to be implementing the new uh, cell phone policy this school year to ho help hopefully help with that um, that focus so students can feel more prepared and ready for college ready for um, you know life outside of school so your input was from students themselves that their own mental health mm -hmm. issues are not being addressed yes what are their mental mental health issues as they perceive them I think that students felt again not adequately prepared for um, college. A lot of these students were students who came to high school during COVID and things like that. I think a lot of students are feeling isolated. They, you know, feel like they're struggling in their social lives. I think a lot of that has to do with cell phone use and technology and things like that. So really, I think they're just looking for community. They're looking for someone who understands them, who un to, you know, understand their issues and really is gonna help, help them succeed. So we wave the magic wand, you're elected, you're in the legislature, Put that in the form of a plan. Um, well, I think that you know a statewide policy for cell phone use would be really important, and I think you know funding potentially for um, you know maybe a minimum of uh, depending on school size, uh, you know, an adequate amount of school counselors um, in our public schools would be helpful. What would your statewide cell phone plan look like? That's a good question. I think that you know maybe starting with making sure that all schools do have a plan in place for cell phone use and making sure that phones are being put away during the day and only you know taken out for emergencies or at appropriate times but really that they're they're put away during the classroom during instructional time so that students can really focus on their work well there's been a lot of talk certainly on, on this station about um, low test scores and mm -hmm. and high discipline issues with within the school systems mm -hmm. um, any idea of how to solve those issues within the schools? Thinking through policy ideas right now, but I do know that it's a big issue. I also talked with a few special needs teachers um, in Beddington and some other schools in Berkeley County. Um, and, you know, school discipline is a big issue that they're bringing up, um, you know, the turnover of aides and things like that. So definitely want to make sure that we have resources to support support those those classrooms. Now, there was about the time of the primaries back in May, mm -hmm. the, uh, the hot button issues were, I don't know if they still are, because uh, the school system, the schools were still in session back then. The hot button issues dealt with a lot of social issues, mm -hmm. um, transgender issues in the schools and, and that sort of thing, the, the you know, wokeism kind of, kind of thing. Um, do you think that those still play to the electric? Is that, is that important? Important to you, the um, boys and girls' bathrooms, and, and vice versa, and all of those. Is, is, is that still important within the to the electorate, or is that was that sort of a flash in the pan and it's gone? 
I think, um, you know, no one's really been bringing those up as main issues okay. at all. So it would occur to me, just again, remembering back to the primary days, your opponent, Chris Andrews, is um, certainly uh, to the right of center, uh, quite a bit to the right of center. Do you see that as an opportunity to um, to draw more of the independence than perhaps you otherwise would? Yes, I think my opponent is um, very extreme. I think this his policies are dangerous for West Virginia. I think it's clear that he doesn't share our West Virginia values. I think that's clear in the way that he's been per personally attacking me. Um, and I'm really, again, focused on delivering results for the people of District 97. I'm running op for office to push past divisive partisan politics that I think are really counterproductive to delivering results for the people. I think that he also touts himself as someone who's unwilling to compromise. And I think voters should be concerned because that would make him a very ineffective legislator. Again, I've had, you know, experience at the Capitol working in a bipartisan way. I know what it means to work across the aisle to find common ground. And I believe that that's a skill that, you know, public servants and politicians should have because, you know, when you're elected, you're elected to represent everyone in your district, not just those of your party, not just those who voted for you. And so I think it's really important to have representation here in the Eastern Panhandle who's going to um, work to fight for the needs of all West Virginians. So how do you over, <clears throat> excuse me, how, as a Democrat in a this this district is is split mm -hmm. by thirds um, but over overall West Virginia is a pretty deep red state at this point so mm -hmm. do you find yourself in a position where you have to separate yourself from the far left reputation perhaps not the reality but the far left reputation of the National Democratic Party do you have to walk that line I don't consider myself to be far left I consider myself to be focused on you know local issues I think in my lifetime we've seen a state that's been largely controlled by Democrats a state that's now largely controlled by Republicans and I think what folks overall want to see is their West Virginia values addressed common sense local issues a response to the issues that are being brought up by the voters and so that's what I'm focused on for sure so if you put on a bell curve, the when you, you've talked to a lot of people, you knock on their doors, mm -hmm. I'm sure you get hit with a lot of concerns from you know, a lot of people, but what's the most common issue? You put it in a category, what's the most common issue that you're getting? I think this conversation around growth has been you know, something that everyone is concerned about. People are scared to lose um, what they love about our community. District 97 is very rural, it's very residential, so I'm talking to farmers and trying to find a balance between economic development and preserving and protecting the rural aspects of our life. Isn't that kind of governed by the lack of water though? particularly in your district? Yeah, so water's become a big issue. It's a pillar of the campaign, um, you know, securing access to clean water. I think it's a there's a conversation to be um, held around a few different points. I think, number one, you know, we are ex experiencing a drought here in West Virginia, a Category D3, which means extreme drought. And so farmers have been struggling with their crops, with their livestock, um, and our state's actually in a state of emergency for drought. And so that opens up the opportunity for fire departments to um, supply water to farmers in need if they have the resources. Um, and Governor Justice actually just launched a grant rebate program about a week and a half ago to reimburse agencies like fire departments who were helping out local farmers. So really interested in helping connect folks to those resources. And also when we're thinking about water, that goes hand in hand with our development because because of overdevelopment, I've also been talking to farmers and people who are experiencing their wells drying up, their creeks drying up, and so I really think that a renewed land use study, water use study would be helpful for Berkeley and Jefferson County to make sure that there's adequate water for well drilling and n drilling new wells. Are you finding many people who are saying, boy, I hope we can bring more industry here? Um, I think right size industry, you know, because we definitely want to be creating jobs, especially for young people. Um, but again, it's about that balance. And so I'd be really interested to work with, you know, b both Berkeley and Jefferson County um, development authorities, stakeholders who are who are looking to locate new businesses here. So you yourself are, are, are young, certainly relative to me. <laughs> um, and we hear so much about the, the flight of young people from West Virginia, mm -hmm. probably less from Eastern Panhandle, but just in general. Uh, how do we fix that? It's a good question, something I'm definitely pondering. Um, I think, you know, it's really hard in the Eastern Panhandle to compete with higher wages right out of state. So I think, you know, higher wages for our state and public employees across the board would be helpful. I think sustainable job opportunities for people to feel like they can live, work, and thrive here and really raise a family here. Our guest is Lucia Valentine, candidate for the House of Delegates, 97th District. This is an open seat. John Hardy is the current delegate from that district, but John is not running for re-election. He's running 
for election to the Berkeley County uh, Commission, by the way, and I, I believe he is uh, unopposed and uh, goes all the way through to the seat in the general election, if I recall. We will be doing candidate forums tentatively right now. We have these scheduled for the Berkeley County Commission chambers like we did with the uh, primaries. Uh, Tuesday, October the 15th and Tuesday, October the 22nd to be able to fit uh, everybody in. And I'll give you advance notice, Lucia, October 22 is when we're looking to do some of the house races and whatever Great. that would include uh, yours. So you might want to make on a little the, mark on yes. the calendar Noted. on that one. You mentioned that you were in Charleston doing some work, reaching across the aisle, trying to get some legislation passed or perhaps mm -hmm. even stopped. Uh, can you give us any examples of some of the efforts that you were making in Charleston this past session? Sure. Um, one of the bills that I helped to uh, pass was the PFAS Protection Act. Now, that was last year, but that deals with the PFAS pollution across the state, uh, which is in our waterways. Um, and so, unfortunately, Martinsburg is a hot spot for that pollution because of the PFAS that was found in the firefighting foam out at the guard base. Um, and it's really trickled throughout the state in our in our groundwater supply too. And so it was help, um, helped pass that legislation to address that pollution, identify sources, and action plans are being created to clean up that pollution. Okay, any other things that you worked on where there was some success or momentum? Yes, um, this session we helped um, defeat a community air monitoring bill which would have limited um, uh, efforts, community air monitoring efforts across the state, um, which essentially, uh, would have um, really kind of cut at the knees efforts um, in communities to identify air pollution across the state and, and make sure that um, this, uh, this data was not used for regulatory purposes. The mix right now in the House, I believe, is 89 to 11, mm -hmm. uh, Republicans to Democrats. So let's say that you are elected and it goes to 88 to 12. Okay, or even 80 to 20, whatever, whatever the number is, it's, let's just assume it's still overwhelming. Mm -hmm. How do you approach working across an aisle that's that big mm -hmm. because it's a small Democratic caucus right now yes. and they don't really have to pay attention to anything that the Democrats want to do or have to say about legislation mm -hmm. for the most part. There are ways that you guys can come up the works a little bit mm -hmm. and that was done in the last session, but for the most part, all the power resides on the other side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. What do you do as someone who wants to try to get something passed? I think, number one, I'm really interested in working closely with our current Eastern Panhandle delegation. I think there's a lot of room for us to work together to deliver results for the Eastern Panhandle because I do believe we have a lot um, of common interests and things that we want to see accomplished here. Um, and I think, again, my experience lobbying and working at the Capitol has really taught me how to build relationships. I do have relationships with legislators already, and so really understanding where folks are coming from, what issues matter in their district, and to try to relate it back to you know a certain topic of a bill or things that we're trying to get accomplished is really going to be key. So, um, you know, I look forward to hopefully being able to do that. Do you consider yourself to be a conservative Democrat in the style of the old blue dog Democratic Party where there is were folks that were uh, pro-union, but by and large, fairly conservative uh, in regards to their political views socially and, and otherwise? Or do you find yourself figuring that you identify more with moderate Democrats, liberal Democrats? Yeah, I don't really think that I'm putting any type of label on myself right now. I, again, just focused on local issues and delivering results for the people. Talk to me about locality pay in the Eastern Panhandle. Was that something that you would work for and how would you do it? Yes, I do think that that's something that is needed here. And I understand that um, you know, if home rule legislation passed, that's something that could potentially get passed at the county level, which I think would be important. The delegation from the Eastern Panhandle, when I've spoken to them, and in fact, most of the folks I've talked to around the state are not in favor of county home rule at this point mm. because they don't trust the counties mm -hmm. to not raise taxes. Mm. That's the big concern right now. Mm -hmm. Is there an argument you can make counter to that? Um, I think that if it were put to a referendum, it would be up to the voters to decide. Would you be in favor of that? I would be in favor of putting in a referendum, yes, putting it on the ballot. The state currently is about to enact the trigger for an additional 4% tax cut hmm. to the personal income tax, the state income tax. The governor at one point wanted an additional 5%, so a total tax cut of about 9% on top of the 21 and a quarter that was enacted last year. Do you like the idea of the state continuing to lower the state income tax rate? Ultimately, they're trying to get it to zero. I think we need to make sure that we are putting money back in, you know, um, state payers' pockets. And I think that the West Virginia, uh, you know, the Eastern Panel pays a lot of money to the state. And part of our job as delegates and part of our job as this, um, as the legislature is to make sure that we have strong leadership in the Eastern Panel to bring money home to West Virginians. 
teacher pay. Now we talked about locality pay, mm -hmm. teacher pay in general in the area. Mm -hmm. I believe we've had four or five five percent pay raises for teacher staff, and I may perhaps it even included all the state employees on all five of those mm -hmm. uh, raises. Is five percent enough in, in the next year, for instance, or would you work for a larger pay raise? I think we need a larger raise across the board statewide, and I think that, you know, 5% is a good start, but, you know, even going as far as 10% would be helpful to keep us competitive. In regards to the social welfare issues in West Virginia, mm -hmm. foster care, mm -hmm. uh, child services of sorts, uh, how familiar are you with those difficulties and challenges in West Virginia, and do you have any answers to those problems? Yeah, I'm learning more about our foster care um, crisis right now and child care crisis. I think that... Um, in Jefferson County, the wait time for um, families to get into a child care facility is over a year and a half. And in Berkeley County, it's about six months. And so I think it's really important that we, um, you know, put systems in place at the state level to make sure that we have affordable, accessible child care. This not only affects our workforce participation rates, but this affects our folks who are living in poverty. You know, if mom and dad want to go back to work and get a job, but most of that money that they're making is going you know, towards child care costs, that's really ineffective in helping them get ahead. And so I definitely think those are some issues that need to be addressed. Yeah, talk to me about that issue because the governor mm -hmm. had proposed some child care assistance. There are some in the House who are uh, against that adamantly mm -hmm. as a philosophy. Uh, however, we have a workforce participation rate issue that's mm -hmm. quite, uh, quite the problem in West Virginia. Some of that is related to it's just better, you're better off staying home than you are trying to pay for child care. Right. Walk that bridge for me. I do think it's important for the state to, um, you know, fund these these programs and making sure that we have accessible child care. We have child care deserts across the state. And so I think we also the state has a responsibility to make it easier for um, people to open in home child care centers and, and higher quality um, qualified professionals. Um, and so that's definitely something that I'm going to be looking at through legislation. I have 60 seconds left for you. The mic is yours. Talk to our audience and tell them why they should consider voting for you in the 97th. Thank you. I'm really, um, you know, I love my community. I've grown up here. I'm here to stay and to advocate for the issues that matter most to the voters of District 97. We have a really exciting couple of months coming up. Um, to reach out to voters and get the, the word about out about the campaign. So if anyone's interested in volunteering or joining, my information is can be found on valentineforwv.com. Um, and I'm really looking forward to working across the aisle, finding common ground, and working with everyone to find solutions to the problems facing District 97, the Eastern Panhandle, and West Virginia as a whole. Will you be appearing publicly in the next weeks or months uh, doing any stumping, so to speak? Yes, I'm at the Jefferson County Fair the rest of this week. We have some meet and greets um, that can be found on my Facebook page and some other public events. So um, you can follow along at Valentine for WV. I would not want to play poker against you, Lucia. You keep the same moderate tone throughout the entire thing. <laughs> you don't tip the hand at all. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you coming in. Yourself. Lucia Valentine in the 97th.